Well, good morning and Shabbat Shalom. I'm Rabbi Ed Feinstein, and this is Valley Beth Shalom Torah Study. It is Shabbos Shuva. It is the Holy Sabbath between the holidays of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, part of the 10 days of Tshuva, part of the 10 days of introspection, reflection, and self-correction. And I'm joined this morning by two experts in this area of Tshuva. My dear we're big sinners. Well, we're big sinners. as he confesses... As he confesses here before the world, uh, uh, please welcome Rabbi Mark Gelman of the Aspen Jewish Congregation and the God Squad podcast. And please welcome Rabbi Sherry Hirsch of the American Jewish University. Um, good morning. And uh, we're going to talk today about the essence of the Yom Kippur holiday, the essence of this season, which is a process known in the Jewish tradition as tshuva. Tshuva literally means to turn or to return. It is a time when we turn toward the soul, we turn toward the pattern of behavior that has made us up this last year, and we examine carefully what we've done. And for the things that we have mistaken, the mistakes we've made, for the errors, the transgressions, the sins, the brokenness that we find, the Jewish tradition sets out a very powerful process of self-correction and self-improvement. It was, it's originally found in various places in the Talmud, um, based on various verses of the Bible, but it is deeply rooted in a system that is set out by the 12th century uh, philosopher Maimonides. He says, basically, it, it consists of this process. The first thing we have to do is recognize that we've done things that are wrong which already is a very sophisticated process because it means sort of separating from myself and one part of myself looking back at the other. And the second, set, the second sort of mode of this is to feel remorse, to compare the actual self with the true self, the actual self with my sense of my ideal self, and to feel a sense of remorse at the gap between the two. And then to begin a process of change. And the first thing we need to do is to go back to the people that we have offended and hurt and, and uh, taken from this last year. Go back to all the relationships that we've broken and apologize. We have to make amends to people before we can stand before God. And then having made those amends before people, then we stand before God and we deeply examine the pattern of behavior that led us to this sin. Try to identify why I did this, why I keep falling into this self-destructive pattern of behavior, and then undo that, dismantle that structure of the self so that the next time I find myself in the same position, the next time I find myself in the same circumstance, I'm not tempted to follow that direction, but I resolve to follow a different direction. That's the, um, basically the, uh, uh, the process of tshuva. It involves recognition and remorse and a confession, and then an, uh, an amends made to others, uh, a, re, a reorganization of the self, a resolve not to do it again, and then not to repeat the sin in the same set of circumstances. That's the sort of process that is, um, that is laid out. L let's take a look at each of those kind of pieces and understand what, what they involve. So you begin by taking a look at the self this year and say, listen, you know, this is where I made a mistake. You go to somebody and you say, you know, I said this and I apologize to you, or I did this and I apologize to you. How hard is that? How difficult is it to stand in front of another human being and to admit that I'm not the person that I really want to be? I'm not the person that I thought of myself. I am a person who is capable of creating destruction in the world. And I want to make amends. I want to fix it. And what happens if that person don't want to talk to me? What do you do then? Sherry, what do you do then? Well, there's so many things you just touched upon, and I don't want to skip over any section of it. This first idea of separating yourself from your idealized self, right? I'm a good person. I would never do those things. In order to recognize that you did those things means a recognition that maybe I'm not as good as I think I am, or maybe I'm far from what I idealize myself to be. And that is very humbling. It's also very sad, right? When you're looking at it, it's not like you suddenly sit there and think, this is so great. I'm having this moment of self-discovery about what I'm such a jerk or why I behaved in such a stupid way or what I did. That's a really 
hard thing. And I think people skip over it. They immediately go to, I made a mistake. I see the other person hurt. I'm super sorry. Just let it go. Right. As opposed to that deep sort of first evaluation of, Hey, I got to acknowledge to myself and God that I'm not the person I idealized myself to be. That doesn't mean I need to fall into this beating myself up that I'm such a jerk and imperfect and whatnot, but it does require some pretty deep work. And what I see in, in my own life and also in the lives of others, we just want to get it over with. I hurt you. I'm really sorry. Let's let it go and let's get it behind you, which is actually not an amend. So I'll pause there and let Mark jump in and then we'll go from there. Yeah, there's that's I think that's brilliant, Sherry. I think that's exactly right. And and talking about how hard it is is right also because we we imagine, oh, this is Yom Kippur, we do chuva. No, 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 no. This is this is one of the deepest things you you have to do. And it's the, one of the hardest things you have to do. So it's really fear and trembling. It really is. I would point to the ways we deflect tshuva and think we do it, okay? My favorite deflection of tshuva is you're going up to somebody, which is already a good thing. You're breaking through. You're going to make the effort to actually do something. And you say, if I've hurt you in any way in the past year, if, if I've hurt you, I ask your mechila, which is how you have to say it in traditional Jewish language. You say, I ask your mechila, your forgiveness. But however you say it, if I've hurt you, I ask your forgiveness. What do you mean, if I've hurt you? You know you've hurt them. You know you've hurt them, and yet you're kind of, you're doing a little dance around the actual thing. Is that tshuva? Well, just like, and this is how I take comfort in this, just like Judaism, and it's so wise. It has so many levels, for example, of tzedakah. Say, is it tzedakah to give something with a plaque? Well, yeah. Is it better to give it anonymously? Yeah, that's a higher level. Is it better to give when they don't even know it's you? Yeah, that's high. Is it better to get them a job so they don't have to? Yeah. So it's very, very subtle and clear. It's saying, yes, you've performed the mitzvah of tzedakah, but there's different levels. I think we have to add that into tshuva. There's, there's various kinds of tshuva. Some, you'd like it to be more sincere. Some, it's more difficult. The one thing you said, Sherry, which is also a deflection, is tshuva where you order the person you're asking forgiveness from what they should do. You can't do that. You say, just, just let's let it go. It's up to them to let it go. And that's the big thing. They can say, yeah, you did that, and I'm still pissed at you. Well, now that's refusal to grant mechila. Now the rabbis say, okay, they could be really angry. You got to go back three times. Do you do that? I don't. I mean, going back three times, I've never done it. But mostly, I'd say 99% of the time, when I go to somebody and ask Mechila, they're kind enough, generous enough to grant me Mechila. And that, that goes forward. But I, I, I think we have to beware of deflecting tshuva. Well, there's actually a whole art to this, I have to say. There's actually some websites you can look up. The art of apologizing, with it, which is not an apology. Right. When you hear public officials, politicians, and say, if you were offended by what I said, or if, I mean, you know, what was it? Mistakes were made. The, the use of the passive voice. Mistakes were made. Right. And there's a whole there's a whole culture of this. And the reason is what Sherry said a moment ago, because it's really hard to look yeah. at the self and say, I'm a jerk or I, I've acted like the jerk. I, I, I've done things I, I have. It's really hard to admit that I have within me the capacity to be destructive, to be cruel, to be evil, to be callous, to be indifferent, all of those good things. 
It's one of the reasons, by the way, we're going to say the confession 10 times on the course of the holiday. If you go through the whole cycle of Yom Kippur services, 10 times it's a shamnu bagadnu. Because you got to sort of like begin to internalize it. Yeah, I have this in me. Uh, Maimonides teaches this wonderful thing, which I think is a beautiful, that, that we have to imagine ourselves like a scale. And all of our merits on one side of the scale balance all of our sins on the other. And he says, it's got to be that way. Because if you say, for example, which most of us do, that my merits way outweigh my, my sins, you're going to say, I don't need to do too much tshuva this year because I'm such a tzaddik, I'm such a righteous person. You know, I'm really a basically good person. All that stuff doesn't really matter. Get over it. That, that I think is a wonderful line. Forget, let's put the past behind us. Yeah, that one. That one kills yeah. me. Let's yeah. put the past Don't behind hold us. on to your anger. It's not good. Let for it go. Let it's it go. It's not good for you to be angry at me. Right. right? Exactly. And then the other side, he says, is if you put, if you, some of us are like, you know, some of us are kind of personality types where we imagine our sins far outweigh our merits in which it's, it's futile to do tshuva. I'm such a sinful person. I'm such a rotten to the core person that it doesn't matter if I change this particular relationship. That's the pattern of my being. And my mind says, neither one of those attitudes is correct. You've got to see them as balanced. And that way you have a motivation. You're good enough to do tshuva. You're bad enough to need it. Yeah. And that's, like that's that. the elixir. So that's the process of opening up the self and standing in front of another human being, which can be humiliating as hell, but in some ways it can also be the best education. Well, the also, best education. What you said, Eddie, is when you stand in front of another person and you ask for forgiveness, the belief system is that they're going to forgive you because that's a way to garner the courage to go ask them. And so we started to talk about what you touched upon beautifully is like, what happens when you go to a person and they don't forgive you? Or a person says, I don't want to have anything to do with you. Don't come to me for forgiveness, right? That's, we, we tend to believe like, oh, if I go and ask, they're going to forgive. But what happens when they don't? Well, what, what happens is, what I think is what's so interesting is what happens when you go to a person and you say, here's how I see what happened. Here's the story. Here's the narrative. And here's how I responded. And I'm sorry I was wrong. And the person comes back and says, no, that's not what happened. Or here that you don't know what really happened. Here's another way to construct the reality of what happened. And you realize how subjective your own narratives are, how, how you know, how, how biased your own narratives are yeah, and how you, you construct your, your memories. Right. right. You wrote your own story. And what do you do in that moment? You ask for forgiveness for the story that you've narrated. They then say, I'm not granting you forgiveness because this is my experience of what happened. That, I think, is the crucial moment. That's the moment that do you correct them? Do you sit and just listen to them? Do you say, you know what? I can entertain that this truth may be somewhere in between. Or is it that the moment that you really say, you know what? I own my part and I'm so deeply sorry I was acting out of this and this and this? Or do you make it okay for them? Your story's right. I was wrong. Like that's the moment that I think is the, the most telling moment, as opposed to the moment where you go to ask someone for forgiveness. I mean, I stole a caramel from Safeway. I think I've shared this before in the third grade. And I went to the manager and he was like, it's understandable. Well, that's not the hardest chuba. At third grade, it was very hard, but that's not the kind of chuba we do today kind of chuba we do today is we go, we ask, and the person's like, hey, that's not what happened. I don't forgive you. Here's what actually happened in my mind. Hmm. That's what's really, I think, challenging. Mark? How do you, yeah. How do you listen to that? How do you, how do you acknowledge to another human being, I hear you? I may not even agree with how you constructed it, but now I understand why you're so hurt. Right. Yeah, this, and I'm sorry yeah. for the my part, but I can't be sorry for the way you understood your story, right? Yeah, That's right. tricky. Then Go it ahead, becomes Mark. complicated, right? Right. In fact, I'm sorry isn't enough because that's about you. I can, you know, someone hurt you. You don't care if they're sorry. It's I'm sorry and I ask your mechila. I ask your forgiveness. That takes you out of yourself. The the other issue of 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 tshuva is the 
the uh, belief that it works. You can't do tshuva if you don't believe it works. And a lot of people just don't believe it works <clears throat> for very, very good reasons. It's the difference between forgiving and forgetting. If someone has really <clears throat> hurt you and you ask their forgiveness and they grant you forgiveness, a lot of people believe they aren't sincere. They're just doing it as a formality because you did it as a formality and they still hate your guts and they're not going to be your friend and it's over. And you have to face that reality that tshuva is not a magic wand. Tshuva is all about doing something which may not work, but you're doing it to prove to God that you are a self-reflective human Is being. that why you're doing it, though? I am doing it for that reason. If they accept me, uh, if they grant me mechila, great. But if they don't, and I, and I feel in my gut that I know they won't, and I can't change that, I'm still going to them. I'm still going to them and asking their mechila. The way I taught this concept about how serious all this is and how difficult it all is, was with children. I, I had a board, a wooden board, and uh, nails, a bunch of nails, and a claw hammer. And this wasn't for the little, little kids, but the older kids. And I said, come on up, pound a nail into the wood, and they would pound a nail. And they all pounded a nail. And I said, oh, and take the nail out with the claw, take it out. And I said, so that's what, that's what tshuva is. The nail is when you hurt somebody, and pulling the nail out is when you say you're sorry. I say, okay, great. They get that. They get the image. And then I say, so is that it? Does that clear it up? And they say, yeah, that clears it up. And I said, no, that doesn't actually clear it up. What's, what it doesn't clear up is the board. Look at the board. It has holes in it. What do you do to get the holes out? And they say, Rabbi, you can't get the holes out. I said, that's exactly right. You can't get the holes out. So part of tshuva is not this kind of self, I don't mean to say any of what you said is, because what you said is brilliant and good and helpful, I hope. But I mean, there is a sort of self-congratulatory, unfortunately, self-congratulatory element of tshuva. Yeah, I did tshuva, I did. I'm able to do this. No. Welcome folks to planet Earth. And on planet Earth, a sin against another person is so serious that first of all, you should protect yourself against doing it in every way you can. But once you do it, it cannot be undone. And that was actually Paul, Paul's uh, issue with Judaism when he founded Christianity. I can't be redeemed from my sin. I need something much more powerful and that he found in the death and resurrection of Jesus. So the beginning of all this is to realize that what we're about is a kind of predatory human behavior the bad wolf inside us in the Cherokee legend. You know, you have two wolves inside of you, which one will win? The wolf that will win is the one you feed. I tell that story all the time. I even give out little charms with wolves on them for people to carry on their keychain. We're talking about something so dark and so real and so inextricable from the human condition that the only solution to this is a purification from God for the holes in the board that we can't change. So God, I did what I could do, but it wasn't enough. Can people do that, Mark? I mean, can, can people, can we look? I mean, that's one of the processes that Maimonides talks about. You're right about the idea that the person who comes and asks for my forgiveness because he hurt me, 
And I realize that he's doing this for him, not for me. Yeah. <laughs> that it's a check. It's a check on his checklist. You know, um, he just wants to check off that he did the thing. Uh, he has to hear the words. OK, you're forgiven from me. Not that he really cares to hear the way that he hurt me or she hurt me. But, but I think the, that's but, where the high holidays, the cautionary tale. I think it's to prevent that from happening. Eddie. Yes. Yeah, that's exactly not, right. Yeah, right. It's not about, oh, I have this list to do by Friday. I need to make sure I ask all these people forgiveness. The high holidays are to say that you've done the work so that you're to prevent you from doing that. And then can I look deeply in the self? and find the structures of behavior, the patterns of actions, the patterns of decisions that led me to that thing, that led me to that thing, right? I, I mean, you know, I'll give you a, a trivial example, right? I've been on a diet for my whole life, right? Let's try to figure out what is it that allows me to eat so many chocolate chip cookies? You know, what is the thought pattern that's, well, oh, what the hell, it doesn't matter anyway. That's the thought pattern. Right. Or I'm feeling lousy. This will make me feel better. What you have to really look deeply into the self and find the pattern of behavior that led me to this self-destructive set of actions. The question is, can you then root that out or can you ameliorate that or can you alter it or can you make a superstructure around it that prevents it from happening again? That's the question mark. Or not happening to the same intensity that happened before. Smaller I, chocolate chip cookies. That's Yeah, or less chocolate chip cookies. Because right. at the end of the day, this idea that we're going to make chuva and we're never, ever going to commit that sin again is very lofty, right? The idea is that when we make that sin again, we're going to do it in a new way that's unrecognizable, or we're going to do it in a much more cognizant way, or we're going to do half of what we did, we're, we're going to start to be aware that this is a behavior in our life that we want to change. But this idea that, you know, I, when I make chuva, I never say to the person, you know, and I promise I will never do that to you again, especially with my husband, because mm -hmm. I, let's be honest, if we're going to be married and we've been married 22 years, oh my God. Mazel and God. thank you. And we're, God willing, we'll be married another 30 something or 40. The point being is like, I am going to hurt him again, right? I just want to do it differently. I want to do it better than I, than I did previously. And you Does should that re sense? rephrase that a little bit. Yeah. You want to well, hurt him better? That, no, that's no, no, no. I'm sorry. I didn't mean it like that. Sorry. I'm sorry, saying Jeff. That, <laughs> no, she didn't sorry, mean Jeff. It. no, it's not that. It's that I don't want to hurt him in the same way. And I want to be more cognizant so that I prevent myself from hurting him. Yeah, I don't want to go down that route again. Exactly. Sorry. I want to, I want to find Apologies a different Apologies to my cute husband. A different way to uh, a, a different way to behave in those circumstances. Mark, let me ask you a question because you you play you you painted a pretty dark picture here. Very um, dark. Have you ever seen chuva work? Have you ever seen a person have you in your experience as a rabbi and counseling people and as a teacher? Have you ever seen a circumstance where a person really did turn their lives around? So you can say, I, I, I can at least see evidence that it can be done, that a person can, can I mean, small things, yes, we can break bad habits, we can uh, make better res resolutions, we can work for, but have you ever seen somebody really d do that? Does, is it possible to change a personality? All right, let me give you the brutal answer. No, I haven't ever seen it. Okay. I've seen minor changes in people yeah. and I've seen efforts in people. And <clears throat> rather than ask myself, as I often do, why is that? Why, why is this so hard? And the answer, because people basically are what they are and they don't change. But the, the, so that the answer is look at the people who did change and see what they all have in common. And that's how I've gotten through the total depression and negativity that my belief that Juva basically, I don't want to be so disastrously negative, but it's often not sincere and rarely works. I won't say it never works, it rarely works. But the people for whom it does work is the story mm -hmm. for me. And the people for whom it does work are people who believe that God will cleanse them. If they do what they can do, God is gonna enter into this dynamic, which we haven't mentioned yet, but for me is, as you know, very God-centered theology for me. 
God, God is entering into this. And, and God is giving us a new heart, a, a clean heart, uh, as the prophets say. And so, you know, people who believe that God will cleanse them, if they do their best to cleanse themselves, I think are the ones who succeed in tshuva. Eddie, do you agree with that? Because I really believe people change. Oh, right, so tell me about a case or just describe a circumstance. I just see it all over the place where people really try to live differently than they did in the past. I mean, the most dramatic example is with drug addiction and alcohol addiction and food addiction, all these you know addictions where people find recovery and they find that they were complete jerks and they changed their life. They were people that stole and they don't steal anymore. There are people that lied and they don't lie anymore. I mean, like, I, I see- Really? People. Really? Yes. Liars? Yeah. Liars Mark, 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 let her finish. Let, Mark, let her Very. finish. Let, no, let her finish. I, I really see it. Interrupters, I, that's a problem. Go ahead. But I really see it. I mean, I this year I've asked for forgiveness from four people in a very serious way. Two of them uh, did not accept it. And it's really given me pause on how I want to change. Like really given me pause. One person said, I never want to talk to you. And I really respect that. And if that opportunity comes up again, and one person, it opened us up to a whole better relationship, right? So I think it's like, I think all of them have been edifying and have really affected how I behave and really have changed the way I think about how I want to go forward in the world. Yeah. So I, di I definitely disagree, Mark. Okay, well, only because you haven't had the pleasure of understanding it. And that... That is, I apologize for interrupting you, number one, and I ask your mechila. And secondly, I, I didn't take, say, I accept your mechila. Okay. And and I, and that is sincere. You're and I, too righteous. And I, I say about the people who fail at tshuva, it's not everyone. I, I'm not saying it's everyone who fails at tshuva. I'm saying it's rare, it, it is extremely difficult to succeed at it, and which means that the numbers aren't so good, I don't think, but I don't have the numbers. So this is a matter of belief. But my point about it is that those who do succeed, I want to look at not how many fail, how many succeed, who knows? How do you really know? But I want to talk about those who do succeed. And in the best example of cleaning yourself up from drug addictions and so forth, food addictions, gambling addictions, the best, of course, is a 12-step program. And their fourth step is, I realize that I am in the presence of a power greater than me. A power greater than me. And that's the key to it. Believing that God is helping you do this and that God is involved in purifying you from it. Look, I didn't mean to, I don't mean to toot my publishing horn, but one of the most wonderful things I was asked to do was do a peer-reviewed study for the American Psychiatric Association for their journal. And I did it on tshuva as therapy in Jewish pastoral counseling. And the thesis of the piece was that before Freud and the talking cure and before meds, there were ways that Judaism figured out to help people overcome the predations of, of sin which I defined for them as neurotogenic behavior. And, and that tshuva was one of the ways we invented to help people. It's, it's the way we, we have hope that, that we can continue on in our flaws. Wait, you can't, Mark, now I'm interrupting you. You can't okay, say people you. can't change. And then you say tshuva is the way that we instill hope in humans. No, I didn't say that. I said, most people can't change. Rarely it happens. And when it does happen, it happens for people who can connect to God. That's as clear as I can say. It. All right, let me try, to, let me try to, to, to mediate this a bit. There is a statement in the Talmud Yoma, the Talmud that deals with Yom Kippur, uh, in the last chapter, which is the chapter all about tshuva, uh, Reish Lakish, the great rabbi of the third century, talks about the idea that when we do tshuva, we change willed sins into inadvertent sins. And I've been thinking a lot about what he means by that. And I think I come to understand it. Um, I think I come to understand it. Um, 
when we behave in a certain pattern of behavior and we do it again and again and again, it becomes habit. Habit is an unwilled thought. I mean, it just happened. You think about when you first learn how to drive, it was so difficult because you had to think about everything, how much pressure you put on the gas pedal and how you turn the wheel and where all the other cars were. And after you've been driving for several years, it all becomes automatic. We, the brain science tells us that what happens is it shifts from one section of the brain to the other. And you're now driving and it's just you're doing this autonomically. I don't know how many of you ever had the experience of waking up one day in the car and saying, how did I get here? I mean, you actually drove yourself someplace without even thinking about how you drove to that place. And hopefully it's the place you want it to go. That's called habit. Now, habit is very hard to change. But there is a process for changing it. And the process for changing it is what 12 Steps is all about, is that you move habit back to will. In other words, I watch myself do this and I stop myself. Every time I'm in a circumstance where I know I'm going to eat those chocolate chip cookies, or I know I'm going to say something cruel, or I know I'm going to take something which doesn't belong to me, or I know I'm going to behave because I know that my past has taught me how I behave, I'm going to stop myself willfully. I'm going to stop myself willfully and will a different action. I'm actually going the other way. I'm turning a habit back into a willed behavior because mm -hmm. I'm watching it and I'm going to, I'm not going to eat the cookie. I'm not going to take, I'm not going to say that horrible thing that I would normally have said. I'm not going to blurt out this terrible thing. I'm not going to behave that way toward that person. I, I just give you a silly example, not a silly, it's an important example. This last couple of years, we men, have had to learn all of the patterns that we use to put women away, mansplaining and disrespecting and all kinds of things. And we've become very conscious, some of us have become very conscious that these were habits that we learned when we were little boys. And now we have to redo those habits by turning them back into willed behaviors. And when those willed behaviors become our patterns, they become our habits. So Mark is right to the extent that you just can't change a habit. It takes a lot of work. It takes the work of turning a habit into a willed behavior and then turning that willed behavior into a new pattern, which becomes a new habit, a new way. I've had to teach a lot of young men how to listen to the women that they're engaged to marry. They, they never learn how to listen to women. In fact, the habit that they imbibe from their fathers and, their, and the world around them was that men don't have to listen to women. And you're sitting in a marriage counseling session and you say, stop a moment. Look what you just did. Look at the way you interrupted her. Look at the way that you disrespected what she just said. You completely put it away and disregarded it. Now let's do that again. Let's go over it again. You turn it into a willed behavior and slowly the habit changes. And I, I think that's how a person changes. I think that's the way that, that, that chuva works. I think that's the way that chuva works. So let's stop here. So the question we've taken on today is like the question, can people change? Can people change? So I want, I want to turn the focus now because we have just a moment to finish before we conclude. Uh, and Yom Kippur is coming. And Yom Kippur isn't only for individual tshuva, for the change that is necessary for individuals. Yom Kippur is also a collective tshuva. So I want to ask you a very difficult question, which is if you look out into the world as, that we share, uh, whether it's the community we share, the country we share, the world we share, what's the tshuva that, that all of us, the world needs to do today? What's the tshuva that America needs to do today? What's the tshuva the Jewish people need to do today? What, what is our collective act of tshuva? What sin do we have to confess and what pattern of behavior must we uproot or must we alter and redirect? What is the bigger tshuva, the collective tshuva that we need to be doing today? to start the year with a blessing. Sherry, you want to start? Yeah, I just, one of the things that COVID has taught me, and I hate bringing up that word because, you know, it's like, we just all want to be bit past it. But one of the things that's talked, taught me is that we collectively feel. The feelings that people felt during COVID were human feelings and they were very similar. I'm now feeling depressed. I'm now feeling anxious. I'm now feeling um, hungover. And we experienced them collectively. So when people would say, you know, I'm feeling very alone, people understood it. If we can collectively feel, then I believe we can collectively change. And what that means is to really see the other, to really understand 
how do I think about the other first as opposed to myself first? And I think the biggest sin that we've committed this year is that we've become very transactional and self-focused. And I think if we become other focused, that is the seedlings of real change. And other focused really understands that how I'm feeling is not the most important, it's how we are feeling. Thank you. Mark, what's the chuva we need to do today? Yeah, I agree with you, Sherry. I think that's a wonderful thought and uh, an important thought. Uh, I would only add that I think the feelings need to move to action. Being, being empathetic to other people who are feeling the same way uh, doesn't mean as much to me as feeling empathetic and then doing something about your empathy. And so for me, it's, the, it's an action I'm, I'm talking about the most ancient and irrelevant parts of Judaism that in Yontif sermons, uh, which are the clay kodesh, the, the objects that were in the temple in Jerusalem, and uh, how they really have contemporary symbolism. And one of them is the menorah. And uh, it's actually the only symbol of Judaism. The Mogan David didn't become Jewish until the 12th century. Before that, there's churches with Mug and Dovids in them. And so the menorah, the seven-branched menorah, is the, its symbolic power for us is this. How you see it depends on how you swivel it. Nelson Glick, my teacher, taught me, he said, when we were talking once about the menorah, how it looked, he said, you know, the three branches on each side and center post, he said, Mark, they, they swiveled, the branches swiveled. Now, no one believed that. No one ever thought that except Nelson. But he said to me, I said, what does that mean? He said, that's for you to figure out. So I figured it out. And it was this. If you look at a menorah straight on, you see seven lights, right? You see the seven lights as separate. But if you swivel the branches so that they're edge on, not face on, you see one brighter light. And that's the sin. In our country, in our politics, in our world, we see only face-on menorahs. Everyone is separate. Uh, if you're from another political party, you're a fascist, or you're a, a, a communist, or you're whatever you are. You're just evil incarnate. Why? Because you're on another branch of the menorah. And that's destroying us. In fact, when the God Squad started, we had a mission, which we just thought was not cute, but it, we thought it said what we were, which is we know enough about how we're different and not enough about how we're all the same. Turns out it was a massive mission and it was absolutely essential for our time. And his death still breaks me, but we said it for over 25 years and we did our best to teach it. And I think that's what we have to teach now. We have to need, teach people to swivel the menorah so that our, our differences, which we know enough about, are not the topic of conversation. The topic of conversation is, how are we all the same? That's beautiful. And I, I would add just one, another, way of thinking about the world. I, I'm, I think that the great sin of this moment is that so many of us are playing life as if it were a zero sum game. A zero sum game is a kind of game where if I want to win, you have to lose. Your gain is my loss. You're taking, I'm giving, I'm giving, you're ta I'm taking, you're giving. And that's a bad game to play. It's fine if you're playing a sidewalk game with kids, but when you get to life, life can never be a zero sum game. And I just see so many folks walking the world with this terrible sense that the things that matter to me are being taken from me because other people are getting the dignity that they deserve. We talked a moment ago about men and women. It does not denigrate me as a man to listen to a woman whose brilliance and imagination and conscience 
are so deeply impressive and I never had the strength to listen to her. It doesn't denigrate me on the opposite. It gives me dignity to be the person who elicits her opinion and her and welcomes her contribution. It doesn't denigrate me as a white person to make sure that black lives matter. It doesn't denigrate me as an American to listen to those who come from beyond the borders of this country. It's not a zero sum game. It's a very small planet and playing the zero sum game we all lose in the end. The only way to play this game is to see that my gain is also your gain and your gain is also my gain and that we can all do this together. We can all do this together. Now we can engage in little competitions every now and again, as long as we finish and hug each other when we're done. Because we have to recognize that life is a game where everyone lifts everyone up. Otherwise we all fall down. I wanna wish you a very happy, healthy and sweet new year. Gamar Khatima Toiver, let it be a good year. Let us all be written into the book for a year of life and blessing. Sherry, Mark, thank you. Gamar Tov. Gamar Tov to you. Have a happy, yeah, sweet, so healthy beautiful. New Year. And to everyone who's listened, please. Um, you're welcome to stay tuned after this broadcast, of course, service from Valley Beth Shalom this morning. We celebrate the incoming uh, officers, the incoming leadership of our congregation. A few words about what it means to have a community together. So join us right after this. And of course, Yontif, the uh, holiday of Yom Kippur begins on Tuesday night and extends through Wednesday. Please find a synagogue near you to attend. It's the one time of year Jews show up on time to celebrate the beginning of a new year, to do the hard work of looking within so that we might begin the new year with purity and joy. We'll see you next week. Shana Tovah.